So welcome back everyone. Um, I hope you are ready for um, linear response and optical properties. Arik, take it away. Okay, so now uh, for this talk, uh, I will um, bring you into uh, up to speed with what is possible to do within linear response in, in VASP. So I already alluded to some of the features, uh, but hopefully it will be clear at the end how you can compute those. Um, so uh, linear response, uh, we have the idea, the very basic idea is that we have a system that uh, we describe with a certain Hamiltonian and we can find uh, the eigenstates for it. So this is the, the Concham equations that I showed you on the previous presentation and that you've seen also before in the other talks of this workshop. Um, from this, uh, solving these uh, Concham equations, we can obtain wave functions that describe the system, density, uh, and well, this is, can only be obtained if we have a potential. Potential that, that is uh, part of an external potential that is the potential that the electrons see, so the ionic potential is part of it, but also external perturbations. Uh, the other two parts are uh, R3, so that's uh, all electrons interacting, and then the exchange correlation that I mentioned uh, before, uh, where we have everything else that uh, we don't know uh, of, of how the electrons interact. Um, the total energy is then uh, written as um, in terms of the kinetic energy that depends on the wave functions, wave functions that depend on the density. Um, and then there are these contributions from R3 and contribution from uh, exchange correlation. Uh, what linear response tries to do is to answer this question. Now, if we change the potential, uh, so if we have an external perturbation, so apart from the ions, if we have an, another external perturbation, for example, a laser, um, uh, all, what effect does this have on the system? So how do the other things change? Yeah? So how do the wave functions uh, change and so on? And that is uh, interesting for, for many properties, um, which I will show you. Now, uh, an interesting thing is that these linear response properties can ac be accessible from, from the ground state. So you can start with uh, wave functions and densities and so on from, from ground state and from there on compute um, how your system responds to a perturbation using, uh, for example, using perturbation theory. Um, I split this talk into two, um, two types of linear response. One is static response where it's where the external perturbation does not change with time. So just a static perturbation. And the other part is going to be a dynamic response, where the perturbation is allowed to change with time. Uh, there will be some connections between the two that we will see. But uh, let's start with with a static response. So this, uh, in experimental terms, uh, what are these uh, static perturbations? For example, a dielectric response. Uh, born effective charges, uh, a piezoelectric tensor. These are all quantities, so this, this can be measured experimentally or forms. Yeah? Uh, forms can, can also be measured uh, experimentally. Um, so to, to get an idea of what we can compute, let's start with a Taylor expansion of total energy in terms of different perturbations that we can apply to the system. So one of these perturbations will be atomic displacements. So we look at our system and we think, how will the wave functions, how will this uh, total energy change when we displace uh, an atom, an ion here inside, inside our system? Uh, another um, possible perturbation is a homogeneous strain, so it means a compressed system. Uh, how will this total energy change? And uh, finally, another possibility is to apply a static electric field. So a different here just represents a different uh, potential 
into plates and in a static electric field. Uh, how does the system change? How does the wave functions change? Um, so uh, remember, we will expand the total energy in terms of these three different perturbations, atomic displacements, um, electric field, and strain. Um, so if we consider uh, the first terms that appear, um, the change of the energy with a displacement is a force. Uh, the change of the energy with an electric field is a polarization. A change of uh, the energy with, with a um, compression is, is a strain. So this is, uh, we can represent here. To be more precise, a uh, force is going to be um, written like so in terms of, of the change of the total energy with the atomic displacement. Same for polarization, same for strain. Uh, but there are other terms. Uh, I say terms of higher order, but uh, it's up to um, second order. But it looks like it's a second derivative, but still uh, these are different perturbations that we are considering here. So this is still linear response because uh, we are just simultaneously applying two different linear perturbations. Mm -hmm. Um, and we get these uh, six terms that are um, with respect to these three different uh, perturbations. Uh, these uh, three, these six terms uh, can be associated to uh, quantities that uh, one can observe. So one of them is uh, dielectric susceptibility, that is a polarizability, a piezoelectric tensor, uh, born effective charges, elastic moduli, Force, force constants that are important, for example, for phonon calculations, or uh, force response uh, to the internal strain tensor. This is related to uh, when you apply a certain strain uh, and all the your um, display. So you apply a strain and uh, ionic displacement. So all does that what all does that change your total energy? Uh, so. This is this was this expansion that we looked at. So uh, total energy in terms of three variables. But if we want to compare um, with uh, an experiment um, for certain quantities, we should include the effects of the ionic relaxation in, for example, uh, dielectric susceptibility, piezoelectric tensor, and elastic tensor. So what this means basically uh, is that um, you consider three independent displacements, uh, three independent perturbations. Uh, but if you want to look at how your system, how your total energy changes when you apply an electric field, you should consider that um, the ionic positions will readjust because of this electric field. Uh, and that can be found, so all these energy changes with the electric field can be found from uh, looking at the minimum of energy um, so such that the forces are zero. So this is uh, described in detail in this paper. Basically, what happens is that you will get um, uh, ionic contribution to, uh, for example, uh, the, the dielectric tensor. So remember the dielectric tensor that I showed here before. So the, uh, this dielectric susceptibility here, this uh, chi bar. Now, if you um, consider, um, if you want to compare with an experiment, you should consider the, the relaxation because of the ionic positions. So you get this extra contribution uh, that is written in terms of uh, force constants, interatomic force constants, and Born effective charges. And this, so this contribution appears to the dielectric tensor but also uh, to the piezoelectric tensor, uh, similar uh, term, and also for the elastic tensor, yeah? So these are all quantities um, that if you would like to compare with an experiment, you would like to include also these contributions. Uh, and I will show you later on how this is uh, computed in, in VASP. Now, um, I talked about perturbations with respect to uh, ionic displacements. 
with respect to electric field and respect to strain. Uh, how can we compute this change of the total energy with respect to the electric field? Uh, that, that is not such an easy thing to do in principle, but it has been solved uh, many years ago. And that is uh, using a modern theory of polarization. So actually to compute all the total energy changes with an applied electric field, one has to first um, compute the polarization. And that is done within this modern theory of polarization. Um, that, uh, for example, one, one reference is uh, this paper, but uh, there are many, there are many uh, you can find many others uh, discussing this in detail. And the main idea is that uh, you can compute polarization differences from an adiabatic change of the crystalline potential parameterized by some variable. Yeah. But what this means is you can compute uh, all the polarization changes, basically. So if you want to get a value uh, from, of a polarization, you always have to compare it with some other reference structure. That is this parameter lambda one, lambda two, just tells you uh, structure, a, cer a certain structure, a certain uh, crystalline potential, and another. And you can compute only um, the difference between the two. So you can only compute how it changes from one to the other. So this, in practice, what it means is that you can take a system that is centrosymmetric, where this is going to be zero, uh, and then do an adiabatic change of the potential, follow the polarization branch, and arrive to uh, the polarization that you get on your uh, structure, a structure that you wanted to, to compute uh, your uh, polarization. But uh, yeah, and this, this P uh, can be computed in terms of your orbitals uh, using this formula. So it's this kind of a barely phase. Um, evaluating this directly is uh, problematic uh, because uh, orbitals are in uh, different K points and they will have um, an arbitrary phase due to the diagonalization routine. So when we do this computation, the computation of the orbitals inside VASP, they get a, an arbitrary phase due to the diagonalization. And so if you would try to compute this um, integral as written here, uh, you would get basically a sum of these different arbitrary phases from, from, from the orbitals, uh, because we are doing this derivative with respect to K. Uh, and you would get a result that is not uh, very sensible. And now to overcome this, this is a technical aspect, let's say, uh, to, to overcome this problem, uh, King Smith and Vanderbilt uh, um, suggested uh, a numeric uh, algorithm to evaluate this integral in, in two parts. So this is normally a 3D integral, integral over the reciprocal space so on the Berlin zone. And what he suggests is to do a 2D integral and a, two, and a 1D one. What this means basically is that your polarization for a given structure uh, is going to be uh, computed from a 1D integral that is uh, computed along orbitals, in, so this is, would be your reciprocal space, and you consider orbitals along certain strings, depending on the direction that you want to compute your polarization. Um, you compute this uh, 1D integral, and then to get the total polarization, you do a 2D integral over the surface here. Yeah. Um, this is still not the final form that is used in the actual evaluation. Uh, it's this one here. Yeah? So this is all described in, in this paper in, in, in detail. But the point is, uh, using this uh, approach, you can uh, compute having, and having the orbitals uh, in your Berlin zone. You have a way to compute the polarization along um, any direction that you want. You can choose uh, strings along this direction, but then you can choose strings also in a perpendicular direction to it and another perpendicular direction to it. So, uh, but you can compute the polarization in all the three directions. And this is implemented in VASP. And once you know the polarization, you can compute the total energy with an applied electric field. Uh, that was uh, proposed uh, by, by Nunes and Gonze in this uh, publication. 
And what they say is that you will add an interaction term um, to your total energy that is related to the electric field that you apply um, and the polarization. So your, your energy is no longer, uh, so it's, it's a ground state, let's say, uh, and this term that comes from a finite electric field, this E determines your finite electric field, and P is the polarization that we just learn out or we can compute. Yeah. So I, mean, I write it here in this way, but we know that in practice we have to use the, the algorithm of, of King Smith and Vanderbilt. Then this, uh, in terms of um, Concham equations, will give you an additional term that you have to, to include. Uh, that depends, again, on the magnitude of your electric field that you apply and um, on the orbitals. Uh, and uh, so it's, it's again, a kind of finite difference formula for uh, the change of the orbitals. Um, that is actually shown in detail in, the, in, in, in this paper of Nunes and Gons. Um, I, I even wrote here the equation, so you can go to this publication and find the, the, the exact equations where this is done. Uh, he basically compared a Sternheimer equation uh, obtained from a discretized form uh, with one from a continuous form. And he was able to show that uh, this term that we need to include to get our, um, you know, in our Hamiltonian here. Yeah. So this, this term here um, can be. Um, it's kind of a, a stencil, a, a kind of a, a, a way to approximate the derivative of the orbital with respect to k. Yeah. So this is basically a, a finite differences formula to compute the derivative of these orbitals uh, with respect to k. That means if we want to find uh, the derivative of the orbital with respect to k at a particular point, what we need to we need to have the information of the orbital at k plus uh, k plus one, let's say, so meaning at the adjacent k point, uh, and this one on, on the other side. Yeah. So uh, th this is a graphical representation. Um, this is just a graphical representation of the formula here. To find the derivative of an orbital at k we need the information of the orbital at an adjacent k and the other adjacent k. So this is kind of a finite difference formula over the reciprocal space. And so then the derivative of the orbital at, the, at any point is determined from its neighboring k points. This is um, within this framework of P that is uh, what is described in this paper. Uh, in VASP, this requires a regular grid, so k points regular grid, and can be activated when you set uh, LP true. Uh, this, this will be computed. Uh, and you can choose the stencil, uh, so the order of the stencil. So here I'm just showing uh, um, order two, because it requires the orbitals, uh, at, uh, the adjacent orbitals, but if you have order four, you need more orbitals here. Um, so it's a better uh, approximation to, to this derivative of orbital and k. Um, but yes, then with that, you, uh, you are able to compute your uh, pol polarizability, uh, your polarization, sorry. Um, polarization times a finite electric field that will enter in your uh, electric enthalpy. And uh, the um, at each time that you do an update of the orbitals, you need to choose a new direction where you, where you update the orbitals. Uh, that is represented by this parameter theta here. Uh, you would have a certain uh, direction that minimizes your conchan energy. If you didn't have any electric field, you would just have a certain uh, parameter that minimizes your conchamp energy. And this is how a normal self-consistent cycle would proceed. You would always find the minimum of this parameter that, and to update orbitals in this direction. But now if you have an electric field, um, you have a, a term that is uh, linearly increasing yeah, with the, the strength E. 
that you chose. So your enthalpy will have this kind of pockets. Um, and you, if you want to find the minimum, you have to choose them. Uh, you have to, to, to end up in one of these uh, pockets. Now, in uh, real space, so this is here a space where you are just kind of updating the orbitals and you have to choose a direction. Now, if you think, if you, if you ignore this picture here, and if you think of uh, what this looks like on, on the picture that I had shown before, where you apply uh, a difference of potential in your system, what will happen is that you will have um, a, a certain potential in your system and uh, your valence bands will, will look like so if you could represent them in real space. And beyond certain potential, um, your uh, gap, um, you, you would have tra a transition between electrons from conduction from valence bands to conduction bands. Basically, you would have a tunneling uh, effect between this, the electrons in, in valence to conduction. That, depending on the size of the box that you use to do the simulation. So, and the size of the box, if you remember the previous presentation, it's related to size of the supercell or um, K points as well. Yeah. So when you have a K point, you have unit cell and with K points that in real space could correspond to a supercell and with one K point. Uh, so basically, if you uh, do these calculations with PEED, uh, you, need, you need to be careful of this condition. And this is a kind of enforced in VASP. So if this um, VASP will produce a warning if this uh, condition is observed. What does this mean? Uh, here you have an electron charge, so just a constant. Uh, here is the strength of your electric field. Uh, AI is the lattice, lattice vector along the direction. And uh, E gap is the, the gap energy that you on your system. Uh, and NI is the number of K points along the direction, or uh, if you were thinking of a supercell, the number of periodic copies of your of your unit cell. Um, so that I mean that can uh, you have to to see uh, whether you are including the length here uh, the, in the lattice vector or or here in the k points. Yeah. So that's why uh, the size here is related to this uh, one times the other. But in short, what happens is um, so in short is p only works for semiconductors. You need to have a gap. If you don't have a gap, then uh, you don't have this minima and you cannot uh, make, um, use a conjugate gradients algorithm to find your new orbitals, updated orbitals uh, under um, applied electric field. Uh, but also the electric field that you choose has to be uh, small that this condition is not uh, fulfilled. So. If this condition is fulfilled, then you will have a warning in VASP, and you might be in a situation where your self consistency, uh, your, your self consistent cycle does not converge. Yeah. Uh, you would notice it uh, in VASP. You would probably reach uh, the end of iterations, and the default is 60. You would see uh, that, okay, your, your um, calculation ran over 60 calculations, and then your results will likely not make any sense at the end. Uh, so, uh, be careful. Gap systems, small electric fields. That's where you can use PID. But now you have a way to uh, apply an electric field and see how your orbitals change with this electric field. That can be done in VASP by setting LCOG EPS equals to true. Uh, the, the electric field uh, is controlled by this E field PID, and you can choose a different electric field along the three directions. So that is because if you have different, um, if you have a cell that is longer along each a certain direction, you might need to change this by hand, you might have to tune it. But the default is a 0 0.01 EV angstrom uh, in all the three. So it's, all, it's the same in all the three. And then uh, if you set this in VASP, uh, internally it will set a field into each of the three directions for each of the three directions of the self con the conjunct system self consistently and once you do that you can uh, you have certain orbitals uh, under an applied electric field that you can compare with the orbitals without electric field and we know also to compute the polarization should be on the previous slide 
So you can compute the polarization for the orbitals with an applied electric field compared with the orbitals without electric field, divide by the magnitude of the electric field that you chose. So this is finite differences, yeah, this formula here. Uh, that's why, in general, it's good to use a small value for the electric field. And with this, you have uh, chi, so the dielectric uh, susceptibility. Basically, how your polarizability changes under an applied electric field. Uh, so, and from the dielectric polarizability, you can compute your uh, macroscopic static dielectric tensor. Yeah. Uh, uh, just to recapitulate, we applied an electric field to the system. We obtained the wave functions with this uh, applied electric field. We ask what is the polarization for applied electric field and without applied electric field. We see how it changes and we get um, your, uh, the static dielectric tensor. Same thing, uh, we can compute forces for these uh, orbitals uh, with electric field. And that, uh, in this case, will produce the bone effective charges. Same for stress tensor, will obtain the piezoelectric tensor. So if you, from a practical point of view, if you set l -calc EPS to true in VASP, uh, it will run these this calculations along the three the, of the electric field along the three directions. And at the end, in the outcard, you will have macroscopic static dielectric, dielectric tensor, more effective charges, and a piezoelectric tensor. Uh, then you can also choose to include local field effects or not, setting L, LRPA to true or false. Yeah, but I will uh, revisit this uh, in a while. Uh, so, that was electric field perturbation, and we could already obtain uh, three quantities of interest. Now, another quantity of interest is uh, interatomic force constants that are important for phonons. Uh, that can be uh, turned on in VASP by setting Hyperion to five or six to compute this uh, in an automatic way. What is done internally in VASP is uh, ion, a certain ion B, uh, call it ion B is displaced in a certain direction, J. And the forces are computed for all the other atoms. So that would be Fa, where A is all the other uh, atoms. Uh, atoms ions, yeah? I'm using here the interchangeably, but yeah. Uh, so from the change of uh, the forces with the displacement, meaning uh, you, you compute the force with the displaced ion and without, well, without, in principle, it should be zero. Uh, you get, uh, it should be zero because before doing a, com a computation of the force constants, you should relax the structure. It should ensure that, the, um, that all the forces are zero because what you are representing here is the, um, the change of the energy uh, with these two uh, displacements. So this is a kind of the harmonic approximation. These are the, harmonic interatomic force constants. And uh, so you should ensure that uh, the undisplaced cell the forces are zero. Um, and then VASP, what it does is displaces the ion, computes the forces on all the other atoms. So you can see how the force changes uh, changed with this displacement. So you get your interatomic uh, matrices, yeah. interatomic force constant matrices for atoms, for pairs of atoms and in the different directions. Um, the difference between Iberion 5 and 6 is just that in Iberion 5, all the atoms in the supercell are displaced in three Cartesian directions, so in, in all the three uh, directions, yeah. In uh, Iberion 6, only the irreducible displacements of the atoms in the primitive cell uh, are uh, displaced. Um, and the full uh, force constant matrices are obtained by symmetry. So this is in general, the mode that you want to, to use. Uh, this one is more for debugging purposes. So this will greatly reduce the amount of self-consistent calculations with displaced ions that you need to do. Uh, and three uh, just sets uh, how many displacements are used in each direction. Uh, this is from standard finite differences perspective uh, you do a displacement, a positive displacement, a negative displacement, 
uh, and he used that to compute the interatomic force constants matrices. The default is two, uh, that means plus and minus displacement, uh, and the derivative is computed with finite differences. Now, if you have, uh, when you have the force constants, uh, VASP will build uh, the dynamical matrix for the gamma point, and you can determine the formal frequencies and displacements in the outcar for the gamma point only. You can use a supercell to access other Q points. Uh, so if, if you increase this, so if you have a unit cell, say of two atoms, and you compute the, the dynamical matrix at gamma, you will get uh, six frequencies, six modes, uh, for two atoms in three directions, so that's six. Uh, and if you, as you increase the size of this uh, supercell, meaning uh, copies of you take copies of your unit cell, uh, you will get more frequencies at the gamma point. But these are basically backfolded points from from other regions in the Berlin zone. Uh, if you want to look at it from a phonon dispersion perspective, that is normally what we would want to compare to to an experiment. Um, you can use other tools, like for example, phonon pi. Uh, in that case, you you articulate VASP with with this external code. This external code will do will generate supercells, and uh, will read the force const the forces or force constants that VASP produces, uh, and it will plot the the phonon dispersion. Yeah. Um, then if you want to do some visualization of the phonon modes, like, like I show here for this example for silicon, you can uh, visit this uh, website as well. That works with the output files from, from, from phonon pi. Um, in the future, we will have uh, this feature um, to plot the phonon dispersion in, in VASP. Uh, now, this was mostly up to now uh, using uh, finite differences approach, meaning uh, you look at all, say, all the forces changes change with uh, displacement, uh, and from there you get the interatomic force constants. Another approach is to use uh, density functional perturbation theory. Uh, this is basically, the idea here is that you have um, your um, quantum problem, and you take derivatives with respect to perturbation say, let's call this perturbation lambda, can be uh, any perturbation at this point. But if you just take derivatives of this with respect to lambda, uh, you get the terms, you reorganize them, and you obtain this Sternheimer equation. You have derivatives of the orbitals, and you have derivatives of your Hamiltonians and overlaps with respect to this perturbation. Uh, this is a linear equation you can that you can solve um, and find how your orbitals change with this perturbation. So that, that was uh, we did that before also for um, uh, applied electric field using this finite differences approach. Uh, so in VASP, there are three uh, possible perturbations that are uh, implemented. Uh, one is the orbital derivatives with respect to momentum. So. Uh, three perturbations within the density functional perturbation theory approach. Um, one is the derivatives of the orbitals with respect to momentum. The other one is electric field perturbation. So you see how the orbitals change with an electric field. Um, the other perturbation is uh, ionic displacement. So how the, your orbitals change with, with an ionic displacement. Um, the, the other, uh, so th these are the three uh, perturbations that, that you can compute in VASP with density functional perturbation theory. Uh, now, if we want to compute the response to an electric field from the FPT uh, in VASP, we set uh, L epsilon true in the in, in car file. Uh, and this response to the electric field is done in two steps. So actually two Sternheimer equations. The first one is to compute the derivative of the orbitals with respect to k. That is done using this um, Sternheimer equation here. Um, but as we've seen before, this uh, derivative of the orbital can also be computed from a finite difference, differences stencil. That is done uh, with p, if you want. Uh, 
you can choose LP through, and in that case, uh, not a linear sternomere equation is used, but um, p proteins. Yeah? So you can combine these two uh, flags together in the INCAR file. And then what you finally want to look at is the change of the orbitals with an electric field. That is done with another uh, sternomere equation uh, that has this, uh, this form here. Uh, what we have here is the change of orbital with electric field. And here we have a polarization vector. Yeah? And here this is has to be done, uh, this has to be solved self-consistently. So there is a change of uh, the density because of this applied electric field. Uh, so this is basically the microscopic, uh, the, the cell periodic average of the Hamiltonian uh, due to the change of these orbitals when you apply an electric field. You can choose uh, L RPA to true. So that means that these changes are included at the R3 level only, or you can say false. That means that um, also changes of the exchange correlation uh, potential are included. Now, uh, the reason why we needed this derivative of the orbital um, with respect to K is uh, because of this. Uh, term here. So this B is the polarization vector and it is written in terms of this, uh, like so. So B is uh, written in terms of um, this derivative of the periodic part of the orbital. Then there are these uh, momentas of the one center terms uh, that can be computed like so. Uh, this is all described in this publication, the details. Uh, and so you have uh, your polarization vector in the PAW basis. Uh, if you, if we would be using norm conserving potentials, this B would be would have a simpler form. So B would be equals to 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 just this simple change of the period of the orbitals. Um, so now we computed the change of the periodic orbital with an electric field. We have also a polarization vector that I just showed you here how to compute. Uh, internally, in VASP, these quantities are available. We can compute the microscopic dielectric matrix. That is just when you set L epsilon to true, this is all done inside VASP. Uh, in the output file, you will find um, microscopic uh, static dielectric tensor uh, with, this, uh, with this quantity computed. If then you want to compute um, Born effective charges, for example, uh, what is done internally in VASP is the following. We know the orbitals without applied field. We know that all the orbitals change with a finite field. So we can use a finite difference formula like we did before. Um, like so, so uh, we, we, we have uh, the, the orbital, we know how it changes, we apply a finite electric field, kind of. So we see how the orbital is under uh, this finite applied field. We can compute the forces for these orbitals uh, for a plus displacement, so a positive um, uh, electric field or a negative one, and then do a derivative um, with respect to this uh, strength of, of uh, the parameter. Uh, here, there might be a two missing, actually, because this is uh, central uh, differences. Yeah. But OK, this is all computed inside VASP. So it is missing in this formula that I'm showing you here. In, inside VASP, it is correct. Um, then in, you obtain uh, born effective charges uh, in the output file. And additionally, a piezoelectric tensor um, computed from the FPT using this, this scheme. Uh, if Now, if you combine L epsilon true or L calc eps with Ibrion 6 uh, or 8, then you have all these quantities available inside VASP. So these quantities are all computed. And you can obtain uh, the, um, the full piezoelectric tensor. So, not just the ion clamped one, meaning the one where um, the ions are kept fixed 
but also uh, the additional contribution that comes from allowing the ions to relax when you apply uh, this um, electric field yeah, to, to compute the piezoelectric tensor. Uh, these different terms are written in the out, uh, the outcar file of VASP, uh, like so. So um, the ionic contributions to the piezoelectric tensor is this term here. And um, this is the ion clamp uh, piezoelectric tensor. And the total one will be the sum of these two. Uh, same for elastic moduli. If you combine Ibrahim 6 or 8 uh, with, um, so if you also additionally compute the, um, the change due to strain, that is with IC4, then uh, you obtain not just ion clamped elastic moduli, but also the contribution uh, due to the ionic relaxation. And again, this is written in the outcar file. Uh, so this contribution from ionic relaxation, symmetrized elastic moduli, and also the total is written in the outcar file. Last but not least, dielectric tensor, um, same thing. Uh, if you combine L epsilon true, L calc eps true, and Ibrahim six and eight, so this means that in this driver, you compute the interatomic force constants. Uh, with these drivers here, you obtain also the Born effective charges. So you can compute this term here. Uh, and this term was computed just from this driver. So in the end, if you combine this in the input file, you will obtain all these quantities in the outcar file. Um, so the macroscopic uh, static dielectric tensor, uh, ionic contributions. So the ionic contributions to the macroscopic static dielectric tensor, and also the ion clamps uh, part. Now, to summarize, uh, you have, uh, there are uh, now uh, ways to compute dielectric tensor, one effective charges and the piezoelectric tensor, uh, roughly two different approaches. Uh, finite differences that you can set with L calc EPS equals to true, and that works to with any DFT functional, but also hybrid functions. Um, this uses speed and it only works for systems with a gap. If you are using a standard DFT functional like LDA or GTA, then you can use uh, an function perturbation theory. Uh, that is, you can set L epsilon equals to true, uh, and uh, it will use this uh, Steinheimer equations that I showed you before. Um, you can also turn uh, to use uh, P true. So that means uh, that the derivatives of the orbitals with respect to K are computed using this uh, finite differences stencil. Um, for phonons, same thing, two approaches, finite differences uh, that works for DFT or hybrid functionals, uh, or density functional perturbation theory that will only work for uh, standard LDA or GGA um, uh, functions of the density. So this, this was uh, static responses. Now for dynamic response, that is uh, in the case where you have an external perturbation that changes with time. Um, this is uh, important, this type of perturbations for, uh, for example, uh, optical properties of semiconductors or metals. Ah, uh, with respect to metals, I want to say one thing here. Um, L calc EPS uh, works only for systems with a gap. But if you want to compute a, a dielectric tensor for, for metal, you could do so with, um, with a DFPT. Yeah. So just, just a small note. Um, back to dynamic response. Uh, you are interested in dynamic response. That's, for example, for cases where you want to look at optical properties, meaning um, how your system reacts to uh, light with a certain frequency. Uh, that can be that it absorbs light at a certain for certain frequencies, um, but also how it can how it reflects it, or or as you can also look at an energy loss spectrum, etc. Also, from a um, theoretical point of view, uh, I will mention how you can compute uh, 
the microscopic uh, polarization, uh, pol polarizability. And this microscopic polarizability is essential for GW methods or for optimized effective potentials or beta subpeter equation. So this you will talk again about uh, tomorrow. But uh, in any case, it's already important to, to, to introduce it here for even if you want to compute just optical properties, uh, so absorption spectrum, that is the main thing that I will show today. Um, so in linear response, um, from the first slide, uh, I, I mentioned that uh, you are interested in seeing how your system reacts to an external perturbation. So an external potential, that is, this would be this uh, wiggly line that's basically a, would be a laser, for example, uh, changing your, your system, or can be just light changing your system. And uh, that perturbation will induce a certain um, charge density. So your charge will change because of this perturbation. Um, that is, uh, you can relate this uh, external perturbation potential to your induced charge through a function that is um, the reducible polarizability. The, you can also relate the total potential that is uh, equal just to the external potential that you applied, so your perturbation, plus the induced potential. So you, you apply an external perturbation to your system. You have an induced charge. And this induced charge will, of course, lead to an induced potential as well. And then your total potential is going to be the external potential that was applied plus an induced one. Um, and you can relate uh, the induced potential, the induced charge density, sorry, to your um, total potential through this irreducible polarizability. So we have here uh, three functions that relate uh, the potentials and so relate the external potential to the total potential or the external potential to induced um, to or the external potential to an induced charge or the total potential to an induced charge. Uh, the question that what we will try to answer here is how, how to compute these things. How can this be done inside VASP? Um, it can also, so it can be shown that uh, in a quantum system, this relations between the different uh, quantities that I showed before. So remember, uh, reduced polarizability, irreduced polarizability, so it's with a zero here, uh, and um, inverse microscopic dielectric response. Uh, it can be shown that in, in the quantum system, this uh, relation holds. Uh, the you have uh, irreducible polarizability, you have the reducible polarizability, you have also uh, the exchange correlation kernel that is uh, here in this case defined as the change of the exchange correlation energy with respect to two densities. Or you can see it as a change of the exchange correlation potential with one density. And um, a, a polarization as well, this P. And uh, V is the Coulomb kernel, so just a Coulomb, the Coulomb potential. Uh, the dielectric response and inverse can also be written in terms of these quantities, uh, like so. And finally, uh, if one sets the this cool, the DFT exchange correlation kernel to zero, one obtains the RPA approximation for the dielectric function. Uh, that can be seen directly from these equations here. If fxc is zero, then we have p equals to x zero, that is here. And here we have um, x equals to x zero plus x zero um, v times chi. So this is just set to zero and that we have here. Yeah. So we can write uh, in the RPA approximation, we can write the uh, reduce uh, the reducible polarizability in terms of the irreducible one in a Dyson-like equation. Now, 
how can we compute these quantities? That is the main point. Uh, so that has been shown uh, by Adler and Weiser. Uh, they derived uh, independently um, expressions for the irreducible polarizability in the independent particle approximation in terms of block functions. That from looking at the change of the induced density with uh, the total potential. And the expression is, is like so. So uh, we have uh, these orbitals computed in VASP. We have energies. We have all the ingredients uh, needed to compute uh, this um, irreducible polarizability. I should point out here that uh, this uh, is a, a non-local quantity that depends on G. So it depends on G prime and G and on this Q vector. Yeah? So it's, um, if you think of, of uh, storing this quantity, it will depend on the cutoff that you choose uh, for your wave functions. Uh, and Q, it's related to the mesh that uh, you use, uh, or the mesh where you know your orbitals. So um, in VASP, by default, the K is going to be, uh, in this, uh, when, when computing this irreducible polarizability, <clears throat> K and Q are going to be the same. Uh, additionally, uh, notice that uh, to compute this um, reducible polarizability, you require a sum over states. So um, the, this sum over states meaning sum over orbitals. Um, you have n prime and n, and you have to sum over them to get them uh, your final. Um, Irreducible polarizability. Uh, in the end, to have a good description of this function, you always need to check the conversions with respect to the number of orbitals. That's number of orbitals, that's number of bands in your calculation. Uh, so we have a way to compute uh, chi uh, zero. Uh, and the RPA dielectric function can be written in terms of that. Uh, so that's one minus VC, that's the Coulomb uh, kernel. So in, in reciprocal space, you can write it like this. Um, this is the quantity that I showed you on the previous slide, how to compute. This is the Coulomb kernel, and this is uh, just the delta function for, for G and G prime. Uh, so now you have uh, epsilon at the RPA level. If you want to include um, exchange correlation uh, at the DFT level. Um, that is done like so. So this will be the expression. And uh, Fxc, uh, as I showed you before, is this form. And uh, your epsilon at the DFT level is similar to the above, except that instead of having uh, x0, now you have x0 uh, minus Fxc x0. Yeah? So again, if you look at if you set fxz to zero here, uh, you recover the result of RPA. Yeah. So if you don't consider exchange correlation uh, effects from your um, DFT functional, you, you recover a RPA expression. Uh, now, this, is, uh, this function is used for GW calculations. Yeah? This is, you, you need to have this um, uh, response, this, this function. If you want to to, to compute um, the screen Coulomb interaction in GW, so screen Coulomb interaction is the W in GW. Uh, you will see this in in the GW talk in more details. I just want to to point out that uh, this epsilon, that is linear response, is computed within linear response. Um, it's necessary if you want to do a GW calculation. Yeah. Uh, this is again a microscop uh, microscopic quantity. It depends on the fine details of of your orbitals, on, so on the g vectors and on q. Additionally, um, this uh, dielectric response, if you take a limit of q going to zero, um, you you can obtain optical properties. That is uh, what we will see uh, next. Uh, what is this limit of Q going to zero? Uh, so often 
uh, the, the the perturbation that is applied to the system, for example, uh, laser or, or light. Um, the this external perturbation varies on a length scale larger than the atomic distances. So um, you need to com to to compare with this uh, with an experimental result. You need to kind of do an, a macroscopic average of your microscopic result. We computed this microscopic dielectric function, but what is obtained in an experiment is an average over many uh, unit cells. Yeah. So in the end, you, you throw a laser into some um, material, for example. You shine a laser on the material. Uh, the, this laser has a big spot and it's uh, eating on many unit cells. So you you have to do an average of the effects of of um, that this laser has on your system. And this uh, can be done using this uh, relation. So a macroscopic quantity, so epsilon macroscopic, this is often called epsilon infinity. Uh, here it's written as Q uh, depending on, on a direction. It's written as the limit of your uh, microscopic quantity when q going to zero with, uh, so well, actually the inverse, uh, it's inverse on the two sides, uh, but here you have a matrix uh, of g and g prime, and then at the end you have to take the add. So th this is really, it's a simple, apparently simple equation, but it involves a few steps. Uh, I, I will show them explicitly. So if you have epsilon g and g prime, um, you can separate it into what is often called the ad and the wings. Uh, wings in the sense that one of the g's is zero, but the other one is different from zero. Here is when both g and g prime is zero. And here is the other way around from here. And here is the body of the dielectric function. So it's called when g and g prime are different from zero. Yeah. So you can have kind of this kind this representation of epsilon. And what you have to do to compute the macroscopic quantity from the microscopic one is first taking the limit. So here there are multiple operations being done to this epsilon. Uh, there is a limit, there is an inverse, and there is a obtaining a matrix element of this, this big matrix. Yeah? So first you have to take the limit. So you have your dielectric function, you take the limit of Q going to zero. Uh, then you invert this matrix for every frequency omega that you want. So it's an explicit inversion of a matrix that can be big depending on the number of G vectors that you have in the system. And then you inverse the head. So you took the limit. Again, you took the limit. You compute the inverse of this matrix, and then you uh, take the head. So that means a, a zero zero. So that's accessing the after the diagonal. You invert this matrix. You access the head here, uh, and you take the inverse of that, and then you get your uh, microscopic quantity. So this is just to say that there is a connection between the, this uh, microscopic quantity and the macroscopic one. You just need to go through this procedure. And this is done in VASP, of course. Um, I will show you how you can do that computation. Uh, I also want to point out is that if uh, you neglect lo uh, local field effects, neglecting local field effects means setting all um, matrix elements of this, uh, of this matrix where G is different from G prime to zero. So basically, you will have a diagonal matrix. If you have a diagonal matrix, inverting is very simple. So you just take the inverse of the head and then the inverse from one side, inverse from the other uh, cancels out. And then this is what you have. But this is only if you can like, like local field effects. Yeah? These local field effects are important uh, depending on, on the system that you are considering. So if you have a very inhomogeneous system, it's important to include the local field effects to get a, an accurate macroscopic description of your system. 
another point I want to make is that in DFPT or finite differences, uh, the finite differences meaning with L calc EPS that I showed before, uh, the macroscopic dielectric function is computed directly without needing for an explicit inversion of the microscopic dielectric function. So in the DFPT and finite differences driver, this is computed directly. There is no need for to do an, an inversion. Yeah? It's just a, a different formulation of the problem that, that allows you to compute this directly, macroscopic average, so the, the, what you would compare with an experiment. But uh, using uh, VASP, you can compute the, the microscopic quantity with algo chi. This is something that is done if you want to do a GW calculation, for example. Um, you can set uh, the amount of G vectors that are included in, in epsilon, or epsilon, you know that epsilon is related to chi naught. So you can write epsilon in terms of chi naught. Um, and the amount of G vectors that are included depends on E and cut GW. So the G and G prime here can be uh, made smaller or larger according to this variable. Uh, so in the INCAR file, if you set chi, you will compute this quantity or VASP will compute this quantity for you. And at the end, uh, we'll produce uh, this, uh, we'll write this quantity to the, to the outcar file. You have two ways to do it, uh, RPA to set to true. Uh, then you get RPA um, dielectric uh, function. Uh, but you can include also uh, exchange correlation at the DFT level uh, by setting uh, LRPA to false. And in that case, you get the, this uh, change of the exchange correlation kernel. Yeah. So, and in that case, uh, in the outcar file, you will see uh, this uh, type of output. Yeah. So it is mentioned explicitly that local field effects are included at DFT, on DFT level. Um, now, if we want to compute, um, if we want to neglect, if we can neglect local field effects, uh, I mentioned before, there is this simplification that can be done. And th uh, there is a way uh, in VASP implemented that uh, you compute this directly. So you compute your dielectric response uh, without including local field effects. Uh, so in the limit uh, of Q going to zero, uh, this can be expressed as a three by three tensor. Uh, in this three by three tensor, that's your dielectric uh, tensor. Um, the alpha in beta depends on the directions. Yeah? So uh, it's three, three by three tensor because each, the, each uh, alpha in beta represent uh, directions. Um, there are two formulations um, possible to compute um, uh, epsilon in, in this approximation, so neglecting local field effects. Uh, one is uh, the transverse formulation, and the other one is a longitudinal formulation. If you want to see uh, the details of the two, um, I would recommend this uh, paper here. Um, where the, the, the two are discussed and the advantages of one over the other. Um, the equivalence between these two uh, is shown, uh, for example, in the paper of, of Adler. So this, uh, this reference here. Um, if you do uh, calculation, so in, in this uh, formulation here, you, you have, um, an advantage, and that is argued uh, in this paper, uh, that you can, um, well, okay, so uh, if, well, let's put it another way. If we would use this transverse formulation, um, it is shown in this paper that you need to evaluate this type of matrix elements uh, that in the PAW formalism uh, will imply having this, uh, derivatives of the one center terms. And these derivatives of the one center terms um, imply that you have uh, in the podcast a very complete basis. Eh? 
so this formulation is perhaps not the so it, it's a bit it might be a bit slower to converge depending on the amount of um, um, one center terms that are included in in the podcar files uh, so in vasp uh, this uh, formulation is used instead that is uh, faster to to converge with respect to the one center terms uh, in this formulation you have um, so instead of having to compute these matrix elements here, you have uh, these ones here that are uh, expressed uh, like so. Again, in terms of a polarization vector, it is the same polarization vector uh, that I mentioned uh, in the DFPT uh, context. Uh, this can be, a uh, so this is, uh, again, just to, to remind this is the polarization vector. So if you remember from the, the, the FPT part, um, it is written in terms of this uh, one center terms, but there are no derivatives of these one center terms. Uh, so this, this approach is uh, happy, uh, more fast to converge with respect to these one center terms uh, in comparison with the transverse formulation. So in, in short, uh, when you set, L optics true, uh, VASP will use uh, this longitudinal formulation, uh, use this polarization vector uh, to, to compute um, the imaginary part uh, of the dielectric function um, without local field effects. Uh, Again, now this polarization vector uh, depends on the wave function, um, on the derivative of the wave function with respect to the momentum. And, and if you remember in the DFPT context, uh, this was evaluated uh, from another Sternheimer equation. Now in the case of L optics true, this is evaluated as a sum over states. Yeah. So you need to have um, many states to describe uh, this uh, epsilon correctly. So if you see here again, um, this is a sum over uh, conduction and, and valence bands. And to get uh, a, an accurate description uh, of this epsilon at infinity, uh, so this um, epsilon without local field effects, you need to sum over uh, many states. Yeah? Uh, alternatively, again, you can set LP to true. And in that case, this derivative is computed from a finite difference stencil using uh, PDP things. So not as a sum over states, but uh, finite differences stencil. So you can again combine these two together, L optics and LP true. Um, another uh, important thing uh, when computing uh, epsilon yeah, well, this, um, this dielectric function without local field effects is a complex quantity. I showed you how to compute the imaginary part of it. And it is written in terms also of a delta function. So this delta function um, will show peaks uh, wherever there are transitions between conduction and valence states. This is uh, basically um, what we are looking at here is um, how uh, an electric field uh, with a certain frequency applied to, to the material, how it can induce uh, certain uh, electronic transitions in, in the system. And if the, the frequency of this electric field matches with a um, transition between a valence state and a conduction state, then you will have a peak. And the peak, uh, the, the, the width, the height of the peak, is governed by these matrix elements that, that we've seen before uh, how it's computed, how they are computed in VASP. But evaluating this uh, delta function, it has to be done with uh, numeric methods. And, and um, Martin has um, uh, shown, has uh, talked about this briefly. I will just mention it here again. Uh, there are different ways that this is approximated uh, internally. Uh, in the context of linear optics. Yeah? So Martin has talked about this uh, in the context of density of states. Here I'm talking about linear optics. Um, 
And in the context of linear optics, you have uh, possi uh, different possibilities. So you can set uh, I smear minus four or minus five that will use a, a linear tetrahedron reader method to evaluate this delta function. Um, minus five, it will use local corrections, but these local corrections don't enter in the delta function. So if you use uh, I smear minus five, it might, it, it will, it is important to use these local corrections only for the self-consistent part of the calculation. So if you do a, a computation of L optics uh, together after uh, um, self-consistent calculation, then you might use I smear minus five. But for the part of the evaluation of this delta, I smear minus four or I smear minus five is exactly the same. Okay, so just just to keep, to keep in mind that. Mm, and alternatively, you can use smearing methods. So I, I'm I'm writing here all the variables, but then you have to choose which one you want. Yeah, uh, sigma chooses the smearing width. So this delta function that is in principle a sharp peak will be broadened, and this is the broadening. And the function that you choose is can be um, a derivative of the Fermi-Dirac function, so with i smear minus one. Uh, if you put zero, it will use a Gaussian function, or if n bigger than zero, it will use a methyl paxton um, of order n. So that's, that actually, Martin has showed this uh, in detail, how these functions look like. But OK. so. You with this I smear you change you choose how all this uh, delta is evaluated. So uh, finally, I showed how to compute the imaginary part, uh, and the real part is computed from the imaginary part with a Kramers conic relation. Uh, and the um, you can set uh, an imaginary shift for this Kramers conic relation uh, in the INCAR file, and you have to be careful that uh, because the real part is determined from the imaginary part, you have to ensure that. There are enough frequencies to sample this uh, imaginary part. So, if you decrease uh, this uh, imaginary shift, you might have to increase the number of, of um, uh, frequencies at which you sample the imaginary part. Uh, so, these here are just some examples for silicon and gallium arsenide. This would be the output. Uh, so, the, the, this dielectric function is written to to uh, the optcar file, and um, Oh, OK. So then next thing is that you have to know uh, to, that you in this calculation, you have to compute uh, virtual orbitals. So uh, this is actually an important thing. So I will mention it a bit quickly, but um, you need to sum over yeah, states. It's OK. You can we, we can add 10 minutes. It's it's fine. Okay. Yeah, I, th I think this is really important. So um, yes, basically is um, when you have to sum over many states, if you are using an iterative diagonalization scheme, um, it might not be efficient. Uh, you, you have a, a, a basis for representing your Hamiltonian that is depending on the number of G vectors that you have, uh, depending on E and cut. Um, and you can only compute as many bands as G vectors that you have. And But if you want to have um, n bands that is comparable to the total number of, of g vectors and say you want to compute 50 percent of the full spectrum of your Hamiltonian using iterative algorithms is not efficient uh, using an exact diagonalization like uh, like LAPAC provides or Scalapac it's more efficient you will obtain you will end up end your diagonalization faster and that can be done uh, in VASP by setting algo exact so that will just uh, do a call as a LAPAC or SCALAPAC routine um, for, for this Hamiltonian. And you will obtain um, all the, uh, the bands that you choose. So you can choose a very large, uh, you can choose a large number, depending, of course, on the number of G vectors that you have in your calculation uh, that are important uh, for this type of calculations where you need to sum over virtual orbitals or empty states. Yeah. Uh, the maximum number of plane waves, the maximum number of G vectors is written in the outcar file. You can look at maximum number of plane waves. You find this, this uh, tag in the outcar file, and the number there is the number maximum number of, of bands that you can uh, choose. If you need more bands than those, you need to increase the cutoff in your calculation. Uh, another important thing, this 
algo exact, it's okay if you have a reasonably a reasonable amount of g vectors. If you have a very large system, um, algo exact uh, require will require too much memory. So in those cases, if if you look at this number maximum number of plane waves, and if this is on the orders of um, tens of thousands, then you might not be able to do algo exact. So in that case, you might need to use the iterative diagonalization scheme and uh, try to increase the number of bands until your calculation is converged. Uh, now, if you need to do, when you need to have this virtual world those empty states, uh, you should perhaps use uh, GW potentials and uh, Martin has, has mentioned it. Um, so these are the potentials with the uh, underscore GW. So these are just meant to, they, they are potentials optimized to describe scattering properties for higher energy. So they describe correctly orbitals at higher um, energies that are these, I mean, these virtual orbitals. If, if you include uh, many bands, you will need to, they will be higher in energy and uh, you need to have a potential that can describe uh, scattering properties there. So. So for some overstates calculations, um, you might want to use uh, these GW, uh, GW podcasts. Yeah. So they were they are they have this name of uh, GW underscore GW podcar. Uh, they were originally designed for GW calculations, but not exclusively. So the, the main point of these potentials is that they describe better the scattering properties for higher energies. But they also have, uh, in general, a larger cutoff, uh, so more expensive calculations. So you might not want to do this if you want to do, uh, if you just need total energy, you don't need to use, perhaps you don't need to use these GW potentials. Uh, so summary for this last part is just uh, algo chi to compute dielectric function with local field effects, uh, L optics true to compute the electric function neglecting local field effects. Both of these approaches imply some overstates. So large number of orbitals are needed. You might want to use algo exact. And that concludes um, this part of uh, this presentation. Great. Thank you very much yeah. also for um, extending a little bit and telling us in detail about the, the last part is really also important points. Um, so let us do a quick question. So considering the electric field, um, how is the periodic boundary condition taken into account? Um, you had mm. a couple of slides of, um, yeah. for that. So yeah, those, um, those, the do, does the, mm. sorry, let me just add this. Does, um, do I need to consider a slab uh, with a vacuum in the direction of the, of the electric field when I do a calculation? with no. electric finite electric field no no uh, within this uh, modern theory of polarization so you can follow references in this publication and, and look for in general for this topic um, within this modern theory of polarization you can define a polarization from a periodic system so in principle yes you would need to break to add the vacuum somehow to be able to compute this polarization but this is where this uh, modern theory of polarization um, uh, allows you to define this polarization even without having a, a vacuum. Yeah. Great. OK, so uh, let us close at this point so we uh, stay almost in time. Thank you very much, Arik. Yeah. Thank you.